England and her neighbours from 1066 to 1485. Culture and society, war and diplomacy. Subscribe on YouTube for more educational videos of this kind. Norman England and the feudal system. After the Norman invasion of 1066, the Saxon people, the English people, basically were living under the shadow of two powers, their Norman masters and the church. It was a hard life, and the normal life expectancy was something around 40 years. Saxons living like those pictured here were known as serfs, which was effectively a form of slavery, and they had no choice but to serve their Norman masters. Culture and Society Along with the harshness, there were also significant cultural achievements. Great cathedrals and castles were built to a scale and standard never seen before, like Durham Cathedral, whose nave was completed in 1135. Its towers date from the 13th century, although one was destroyed in the 15th century and had to be rebuilt. And here you see Chepstow Castle, which was built on the border between England and Wales in the 11th century and is the oldest surviving Norman castle. The Normans also introduced a complex system of taxation which was backed up by meticulous records and they showed exactly how much land and property and so on every single person in the country owned. Everybody's assets were listed in a book called the Doomsday Book which was begun in 1085 and completed the following year. The University of Oxford was founded probably in around 1096 and Cambridge in 1209. And language. The language of this period is called Middle English. During this time, Old English, the language of the Anglo-Saxons, was influenced by the French spoken by the Norman invaders. At first, these were two different languages, Old English and Norman French. Slowly, though, they started to mix. Old English, the language of the Anglo-Saxons, developed under Norman influence into something that we call Norman English, and the French of the Normans slowly developed into something that we call Anglo-Norman, until by about the middle of the 15th century, the two languages had mixed together to the extent that they formed a single language known as Early Modern English. Famine, Sickness and War This was also a time of natural disasters, Millions of people died all across Europe in the Great Famine in the early 14th century, and between 1348 and 1349, about half of the population of England was wiped out by bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death. Civil war broke out in England after the Great Famine, and following the Black Death in 1381, a man called Wat Tyler led the Saxon people in a rebellion called the Peasants' Revolt. They succeeded initially in executing some members of the ruling elite, but in the end the rebellion was brutally suppressed. There was also a series of wars in the Middle East called the Crusades. In these, Christians were fighting against Arabs for the possession of Palestine. England's biggest involvement was in the early 14th century, when King Richard I, known as Richard the Lionheart, joined the Third Crusade. And then there was England's constant struggle with its neighbours. Within a few years of the Norman conquest, the Normans had taken control of pretty much the entire area of what we now call England. And by the end of the 11th century, they also occupied a considerable portion of Wales. But the Welsh didn't give up easily. There was fierce fighting back and forth across the border, the Welsh supported the Saxons in their resistance against the Normans, and the Welsh even made some successful incursions into England itself. By about 1100, though, the southern part of Wales was effectively under Norman control. And then, over the next hundred years or so, England extended its influence over the central area of Wales not controlling it entirely, but having a fair amount of control and leaving only the northern area fully independent.
In Scotland, there were three basic cultural and political entities. There were the Celts and Picts, who had come together culturally in the 10th century. There were the Vikings in the north and in many of the island areas. While in southern Scotland, Celtic and Saxon people had mingled to a considerable extent. And this Anglicisation of Scotland continued into Norman times. But even this southern part of Scotland, despite the English influence that existed there, remained relatively independent from England. There were a few Norman families among the Scottish ruling elite, and in some parts of Scotland tribute was paid to the English, but the Normans were never really able to establish their feudal system of government in Scotland. By the beginning of the 13th century, the border with Scotland was not so different from what it is today, and also very similar to the way it was when the Romans occupied Britain. Some homage was being paid to England by Scotland, and in the south there was quite a lot of English influence, but further north people lived their lives more or less independently of England. Ireland wasn't very much affected by England until the Normans took control of a large part of the central area of Ireland in the late 12th century. The basic Norman policy was to develop good relationships with the aristocracy. Some of those were Norman families installed by the English and others were native Celts or sometimes Saxons. The idea was that if they could keep close ties with the ruling class, the ruling class would then cooperate with the Normans to control the local people. Now, this policy worked quite well in Wales and in Scotland, but in Ireland the Normans had a lot more difficulty keeping the lords and the barons under control. By the late 12th century, though, the Normans had taken complete control of a significant portion of the country. And, of course, England's relations with France at that time were very important. Although the Normans were of Viking origin, they had settled into northern France and adopted the French language. The Norman rulers mostly married French princesses, and in 1152, Henry of Anjou married Eleanor of Aquitaine, and when he became King of England two years later, that brought a large part of France under the rule of the English king. By the beginning of the 13th century, England had a small empire. That empire included much of France, a fair portion of Ireland, and the border areas of Wales and Scotland, with some control over other parts of those countries. But they didn't succeed in holding on to all of that land. Over the next 200 years, they lost much of it. During this period, England continued with the policy of gaining the loyalty of local lords in Scotland and Wales and uh, attempting to do so in Ireland. And this included, of course, intermarrying. And slowly, because the Normans were relatively few in number, they began to intermingle with the local population. And at the same time, a number of Celtic and Saxon families rose to prominence. During the later Middle Ages, the only territory that England was able to hold on to and extend its control over was Wales. Wales had two great heroes during this period, Llewellyn in the 13th century and Owen Glendar in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. But that was not enough to save Wales from English domination. By the late 13th century, Wales was effectively a colony of England. From the 14th century on, the Crown Prince of England was known as the Prince of Wales. And then, in the 15th century, Wales strongly supported Henry Tudor, who came from an old Welsh family during the Wars of the Roses. Henry Tudor became King of England in 1485, and his son, Henry VIII, formally united the two countries in the early 16th century, making English the official language, but giving Welsh people equality under English law. Scotland was more successful than Wales in resisting the English. In the late 12th and early 13th centuries, 
William Wallace led the Scots against the English. Uh, at first he was successful, but later on he was defeated. William Wallace features in Mel Gibson's incredibly historically inaccurate movie Braveheart. Just as an example, the custom of dyeing their faces with blue woad had died out about a thousand years before. After Wallace's death in 1308, a man called Robert the Bruce became King of Scots. Although he was partly Norman in his ancestry, he was very much against the Norman control in Scotland and he defeated England at the Battle of Bannockburn. In 1357, a treaty was signed guaranteeing Scotland against attack from England and Scotland was an independent country until 1707 when it was finally united with England. The Tudor kings and queens of England were from a Welsh family and the Stuarts who followed the Tudors were a Scottish family. They were brought into prominence through intermarriage with the Norman ruling elite and these intermarriages proved to be at least as important as war in bringing England together with her British neighbours. And Ireland. Unlike Scotland and Wales, no great national leaders came forth at this time to lead Ireland against the English, but at the same time the geographical position of Ireland made it more difficult for the Normans to establish control there. Anglo-Norman control of Ireland was at its height in the late 13th and early 14th centuries when a parliament was established giving them control over most of the country. But their policy of installing high-ranking Normans in the elite of the Irish system didn't really work very well since many of those Norman lords sided with the Celtic people later on in the century and reduced England's influence to a small area there around Dublin known as the Pale. Overall there was a basic pattern of English people pushing in there to the east of the country while the Celtic people tended to move more to the west to get away from that English influence. Unlike Wales, Ireland had supported the losing side in the Wars of the Roses in the 15th century, so when the Tudor king Henry came to the throne, he was suspicious of the Irish, and the Irish came to be seen as a kind of wild people that needed to be tame. Things would get worse in the 16th century when Ireland remained Catholic as England, Scotland and Wales became Protestant countries and Ireland was uh, brutally controlled by the British, finally becoming part of the United Kingdom in 1801. And finally, England and France. In the early 13th century, England lost control of its northern French territories, Brittany and Normandy, and in the late 14th century and through much of the 15th century, England was at war with France. From the middle of the 14th century on, England's main possession in France was Gascony in the south. Perhaps because it felt itself sandwiched between England and Gascony, France itself went on to make an alliance with Scotland in that way, sort of sandwiching England. In 1382, at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, England had only a few small possessions in France. By 1430, it had extended its control over a much larger area. And then by 1470, it had lost pretty much everything. At the start of the Tudor period, then, England was a country of relatively minor importance. Part of this was because of the political infighting during the Wars of the Roses, but the country had also been weakened by its largely unsuccessful attempts to control its neighbours. 